Hey guys, Mr. P. This video is all about the cycles of matter and how matter is cycling or recycling through our environment and our earth. The first thing we need to talk about is how energy flow is different than chemical cycling. So this image is not any one particular matter cycle, rather it's a more of a generic version of the whole chemical cycling and energy flow. Energy is going to be denoted by these red arrows, and the chemical cycling or the nutrient cycling is going to be denoted by the blue arrows. So you can see that the blue arrows are always recycling, which means they're returning back to where they started from. In this case, it'll be the primary producers. Every blue arrow is going to be linked to another blue arrow. The red arrows are originating at the sun, and they are going to be terminating into the environment uh, in a form of heat, which is a waste product associated with a lot of chemical cellular respirations. The main difference between the two, and I've said it in previous videos, is that energy flows in one way direction from the sun through the primary producers and then ultimately through the consumers before being lost as heat or used during cellular energetics. Recycling of matter is going to be recycled and the matter, the nutrients, are going to consistently move through the trophic levels just like the energy does but it will always be recycled. It is never lost. It's one of the laws of thermodynamics. Matter cannot be created nor destroyed. So it will continue to change forms and it can continue to be broken down and built up but it will in fact always recycle and end up back at the primary producers. Matter flows from one trophic level to another, and elements are recycled within and among ecosystems. You will never destroy or lose matter. It is always recycled. The processes that drive these particular processes, and we're going to get into the actual kind of nuts and bolts of the individual nutrient cycles in a minute. However, for now, the generic processes that drive the nutrient recycling can be biological, they can be geological, they can be physical and chemical, and they can be a form of human activity. We will talk about all of these processes that drive the individual nutrient and chemical cycles in a minute. So the first cycle we're gonna talk about is the water cycle. This is probably the most easily understood because you've studied it for the longest amount of time. But with the water cycle, water is going to kind of live on our planet in two forms. You have liquid water, which is standing water. You can physically see that. And there is kind of the invisible water, which is water vapor that is in our atmosphere. It's one of the greenhouse gases. It's one of the reasons why our atmosphere retains heat. But the driving force for the evaporation process, and I say evaporation transpiration, evaporation is the ability of liquid water to break the bonds between the water molecules and end up entering the atmosphere in the form of water gas or water vapor. Transpiration is the same kind of process, but it happens through plants. So when plants take in liquid water through their roots, they're going to have a kind of a one-way flow or a one-way stream of water all the way through their roots, stem, shoots, and leaves. Transpiration in plants consists of water being brought into the plant through the roots and then moving up the stem one molecule at a time in a chain of water molecules until it evaporates through the leaves through a little pore called a stomata. We'll get more into the, the intricacies of that when we get into photosynthesis, but for now, Water will either move through the atmosphere in a form of evaporation or will move through a plant, still evaporate into the air, it just moves through a plant while it does that. However, water enters the atmosphere. That's kind of step one for the water cycle. Once the water vapor is in the atmosphere, it can be transported great distances by wind. Uh, we've talked in other videos about wind currents, how in the northern hemisphere or the southern hemisphere, depending on what latitude you're on, can impact the kind of prevailing winds of that particular region. Well, those prevailing winds can move this condensed water vapor a long ways and can actually cause precipitation on the backside over a variety of, of distances. Air cools the water vapor, so obviously as you go higher and higher into our atmosphere, the air gets cooler and cooler. When the water vapor gets into this really cold, kind of high atmosphere environment, it's going to condense and condense and condense until it forms actual liquid droplets and when those droplets become large enough, they fall as rain, snow, sleet, or hail. We call that precipitation. Once it rains or the precipitation falls to the earth, once it's on land, some precipitation flows along the ground surface that's called runoff. That's physically water running over the surface of the land. However, water can also be absorbed into the soil 
and become groundwater. If the groundwater penetrates deeply enough into the earth, it can become part of an underground reservoir. There are aquifers and other large reservoirs of water deep within the earth. That's the water source that a lot of wells will tap into. Water can be absorbed from the soil by plants through their roots. Once it's in the soil, whether it ran off the surface and then infiltrated the soil or it's part of a groundwater supply, plants can still take it in through their roots and eventually it becomes, again, part of the atmosphere through the evaporation through the plant called transpiration and we start the cycle again. You can see that water is going to cycle through the environment in a variety of different phases, right? Whether it be liquid, gas, liquid, and then if it's in a cold enough region, like on the top of a mountain, if it snows, which is still a form of precipitation, then it will freeze and can become solid water, which is ice and snow. Carbon cycle is the same kind of thing. Carbon is one of the fundamental elements for living things because all organic compounds contain carbon. Carbon, though, can be a part of the inorganic substances like carbon dioxide, but it can also be part of the organic compounds like glucose. Plants will use carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to make sugars in a process known as photosynthesis. Atmospheric carbon is in the form of CO2, carbon dioxide. Again, that's one of the greenhouse gases, just like water vapor. Once carbon dioxide is pulled from the atmosphere into the plants, it's going to be converted into a different carbon-based compound called glucose. Those glucose molecules will be linked into larger compounds called polymers, which are cellulose and starch. Those carbohydrates, once they're in a plant, can either be consumed by animals or heterotrophs and then converted into energy, or the plants can actually go through their own cellular respiration process and convert those sugars into carbon dioxide gas again. So plants are actually pulling in carbon dioxide to make sugars, and then when they break those sugars down, they're going to be releasing carbon dioxide back into the atmosphere. One of the reasons why you see a little mini carbon cycle right here from the atmosphere into the producers and then back to the atmosphere. Once the producers make the glucose via photosynthesis, the producers and consumers are going to release carbon dioxide to the atmosphere during a process called cell respiration. Decomposers usually break down dead organisms, releasing carbon dioxide as well. Part of the combustion or the release of carbon compounds comes in the form of cellular respiration. It can also come from the form of decomposition. The carbon can also be released from biomass, utilizing just normal fire and combustion. When fire burns organic material, it's releasing carbon dioxide back into the air. Where did that carbon come from? It was once locked in the organic compounds that that living thing was made of. Sometimes primary producers are buried before they can decompose, leading to coal, oil, and natural gas deposits. If the organic material dies and finds itself into a situation where it is covered with sediment and then buried deep within the earth, it can form these coal, oil, and natural gas deposits. Once those coal, oil, and natural gas deposits are harvested from the earth, they can be burned for energy, which releases carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. The burning or combustion of fossil fuels releases a large amount of CO2, which is why a lot of the CO2 atmospheric concentration increases is linked to our uh, increased fossil fuel dependence and our increased fossil fuel combustion. If we burn more and more fossil fuels, we're going to release more and more CO2 into the atmosphere, which leads to the Earth retaining a greater amount of energy. If we look at the atmospheric CO2 levels in this Mauna Loa Observatory, which is a island or an observatory on one of the islands of Hawaii, we have seen over the course of the last 80 years or so, since 1960, that overall the CO2 concentration in our atmosphere is actually increasing pretty substantially. Now, if we dive into an individual seasonal fluctuation, you'll actually see that there are a lot of these little red dots that are increasing and decreasing, increasing, decreasing on this kind of wavelength pattern. But as a whole, if we average all of them, the average, which is that blue line, is or the trend line is actually going to be increasing over time. So what are these seasonal variations? Well, if you look at the months that correspond to the seasonal variation, you'll see that, again, this is the northern hemisphere. So in the northern hemisphere, we have summertime in this kind of May through July, which is when our plants are in max photosynthesis. So we have all of our biomass, plants, trees, leafy producers are going to be increasing their biomass through spring. 
And as they increase their biomass, they're going to have more and more and more and more CO2 demand. And so as they grow, the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere is going to actually start peaking and then dropping as all of that biomass is utilizing that carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and storing that carbon in their biomass. As we transfer through the summer and into early fall, we're continually using that CO2, which the level of CO2 is dropping until we get to a point in October when our leaves on our trees drop because it's fall and all of a sudden we don't have a lot of that photosynthetic biomass which means we're not able to utilize or pull that CO2 out of the atmosphere and it starts leading to an increase in CO2 through our winter and early spring. It will then get up here to a peak and then start dropping as our trees start producing leaves and that biomass can start photosynthesizing. The graph shows a steady increase in atmospheric CO2 concentrations over the last several decades. Seasonal variations, the regular ups and downs in the graph, are due to variations in photosynthesis between summer and winter, as I just explained. When the leaves are on the tree, it will utilize CO2 at a really high rate and lock that carbon into starch, which is in the leaf. And if it's locked in the leaf, it can't be in the atmosphere. So the atmospheric CO2 concentration drops. Once the leaves fall off the tree, the CO2 is going to start increasing because there's no biomass pulling it out of the atmosphere. The nitrogen cycle is one that we're not going to get too kind of deep into, but you have to understand that nitrogen, just like CO2 and water vapor, is one of the main components of our atmosphere. Nitrogen gas is in the form of N2, two atoms of nitrogen bound together. That nitrogen gas can actually be converted into versions of nitrogen that can be stored within the soil in two ways. There's nitrogen fixation in the form of our atmospheric, kind of lightning-induced nitrogen fixation. Well, there's also nitrogen fixation that occurs in the soil, and it's usually mediated by bacteria. It is important to note that all organisms require nitrogen to make amino acids, which combine to form proteins. We will talk about that in a future chapter, but proteins are fundamental to the production of enzymes, and enzymes, as you'll learn later in the class, is fundamental to the sustaining of life. Nucleic acids are also equally important. Nucleic acids are the molecules like DNA and RNA, which are used by organisms to to store genetic information. The largest reservoir of nitrogen is in the atmosphere, which makes up 78% of the air we breathe. A lot of people assume that the air we breathe is primarily oxygen, and it's not. The bulk of the air that is on our planet and that we breathe is made up of nitrogen. Lightning can fix small amounts of atmospheric nitrogen, just like some bacteria can convert nitrogen gas into ammonia nitrates and nitrites. Once the gas, once the nitrogen is converted into ammonia nitrates and nitrites, whether that conversion happens through bacteria or lightning, it doesn't matter. Once that ammonia and nitrates and nitrites are in the soil, then the plants can utilize the nitrogen to help them produce amino acids, which helps them produce proteins, which helps them also produce nucleic acids. Consumers are going to eat the producers, whether that producer is trees, leaves, grass, bushes, plants, flowers, and those consumers will get the nitrogen into them as well, which allows them to also make proteins and nucleic acids as well. Once they die, decompose, or excrete, that ammonia gets put back into the soil, and the denitrification bacteria is the bacteria that will convert all of these nitrites and nitrates back into nitrogen gas, which means the cycle is going to continue. So some bacteria obtain energy by converting nitrates into nitrogen gas, which is released into the atmosphere and helps to continue the cycle. The last cycle we're gonna talk about is the phosphorus cycle. The phosphorus cycle is a cycle that will recycle phosphorus. Phosphorus is essential to life because it is part of the molecules such as DNA and RNA. Just like nitrogen, phosphorus is, is equally as important in the production of DNA and RNA, which is fundamental to life because that's how our genetic material is stored. Phosphorus does not cycle through the atmosphere. That's an important note, okay? The carbon cycle cycles through the atmosphere. The water cycle cycles through the atmosphere. The nitrogen cycle cycles through the atmosphere. Phosphorus does not. There is no phosphorus gas. So the phosphorus cycle has to be maintained through different environmental conditions and different life forms. The geosphere consists of large reservoirs of inorganic phosphorus. The geosphere meaning mountains and rocks, okay? The physical 
structure of the Earth. Another large reservoir of phosphate is found in the hydrosphere, which is water, in the form of dissolved phosphate and phosphate sediments. As the solid rock, mountains and rock, which contains a large amount of inorganic phosphate, is weathered and eroded by the running water coming from the water cycle, that water cycle is going to dissolve some of that phosphorus and pull it into and keep it dissolved within the water, liquid water, on the planet. These phosphate sediments form solid rock, which are lifted out of the water due to plate tectonics and eventually exposed to weathering. So if the rock and mountain, which has already been kind of protruded from the water and freestanding in, in a form of geological structure, is eroded, it pulls the phosphorus into the water. That water is going to make that sediment drop to the bottom because it's heavy and more dense than the liquid water. As the sediment builds up, it's going to create more and more and more rock, which through plate tectonics is going to push that created rock out of the water and again expose it back to further erosion and sediments. That's it for this video. If you learned something, give it a thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel. If you have a question, leave it in the comments. See you in class.